evening, good evening, Grenada, Caribbean, all Caribbean nationals in the diaspora, and everyone else tuned in. It's Metro Chat, Thursday evening, 8 p.m., GrenadaBroadcast.com, and all the other places where you can tune into this program, Facebook being one, right, George? Mm -hmm. it's, that, it's that time when we get together here, we call ourselves the usual suspects. Some of us are guilty of some things, but not sure it's anything that the police would be interested in. But we're suspects, always stirring up some kind of trouble in this place and causing consternation and saying things that people repeat without really understanding. But that's okay. It's all part of it, you know. So the usual suspects are here, missing the chief suspect who will not be joining us, he says, you know, sent his apologies, he's traveling, he's not able to join us, and that is Mr. Jerry George from St. Vincent, so he won't be here with us this evening. We have Margaret, one of the usual suspects from over there in snow-covered New York. Yeah, we can reach those, more like rain. I don't, like rain. What, I don't care what it is, it's how. I don't want to be here. Actually, it's not that bad. It's in the 50s. We have this weird weather where it's up and down. So we were freezing Monday, and today it went to 50-something, and I think it's plunging tonight by, what, some 30 degrees or something I saw. So it's kind of like one of those things. When you can go outside in maybe, let me see, two pieces of underwear and something else. When you can go outside dressed like that, then I can come there. As long as the clothes you're wearing weigh more than five pounds, I don't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine over there in somewhere in London. Catherine is in the same situation. Mm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Not that bad. Uh, people, listen, when you say to me, not that bad, and I picture you wrap up in yeah. some heavy coats. Yeah, don't, not... be, don't mm. believe what you see on this internet. Don't <laughs> that terrible. That's fake news. Don't carry that. It's, it's We're not, we not cold that cold. We're not that bad. Right now, I haven't got my heating on. It's quite mild. Oh, oh that's nice. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. So it's really not bad. Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to hear that because I want all you guys to keep warm. Oh, and yeah. our guest suspect this evening is none other than a very popular person all over the globe, you know. I'm sure many people will know this name when you say it. It's Mr. Michael Bascom. He used to be a sports journalist, but he is still a sport enthusiast. I don't think he can get it out of his blood. Oh, no, 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 no. He can give up anything else, but not sports. Yeah, That's yeah. for sure. No, he can stop being a sport journalist, but he can't stop being an enthusiast. Right, Michael? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> thanks for the invite. In fact, um, and you're lucky enough. I've been asked by quite a few <laughs> persons for the week, and you're the only one I actually agreed to. Oh, oh, I wait. feel very so honored, honored and privileged you. that you yeah. decide to join us on Mecca Chat. Yeah, but it is a pleasure, though. Um, Making it make my debut on the program. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks, you see. On Mecca Chat, the only rule we have is that we have no rules. We speak our minds, we put issues on the table, we talk about things, but we always do so with a view looking for solutions. Now, in my country where I come from, in Jamaica, we say we take bad things, make laugh. So we like to keep things light-hearted, and it doesn't matter how crucial and critical it is, we find a way to laugh. Even last week when we were talking about children and their neglect in the society, and we had a guest suspect who was sharing with us how she happened upon some children who really had no parents and were just drifting and that whole situation, even discussing that, we found a way to laugh. Because we don't want anybody blood pressure to go high, you know? We want everybody to keep keep their head level, keep their feet on the ground, so that we can really look at these things from the perspective of saying, 
what can we do to help? How can we make things a little bit better in our corner of the world? Wherever your candle is, keep it lit, keep it glowing. It will light the way for somebody. Don't think you can't do enough. Just do what you can. And that's what we want to do here on the chat. So, the issues we want to look at this evening, Michael, I know you, you have joined us to talk about sports in particular, but we cannot ignore what is happening in Venezuela right now. And we can't ignore the fact that one of the biggest sporting events in Grenada has been cancelled. You know, the fact that the, the fact that the attorney general has come out and said, well, you know, if I'm looking for, no, he said he found a place for the courts to meet. And then the Bar Association said, tread carefully because this lease is not yet signed. Right? So, big announcement, then the caution note. So I am waiting patiently to hear whether or not the lease is going to be signed and work will begin and we're going to know how many courts that building will be able to accommodate and all of that jazz. And in the midst of no access to justice, we hear that interval is cancelled and we hear that, oh, don't worry about that, man, I ain't no big thing. Ministry of Education went put on a sports meet. So, these are the issues we have on the menu. Michael, we call it a menu, you see? It's until we belly full every Thursday evening, 8 to 10. And Margaret is the one who usually leading the way with the eating. With the eating. <laughs> she usually has a bowl of something over there. Michael, you know what she had last week or the week before? Red herring and salt fish, you know? <laughs> well, um, last week in particular, I guess with the, the low temperature and food probably was welcome, you know? Yeah. For, yeah, sure, for sure, for sure. You know, good old comfort food. Can't do it all that. That's what comfort food is usually chocolate. She have red herring and salt fish. What I tell you. <laughs> it just tells you, you know that we Caribbean people wherever we go, we're gonna find our food to eat. Mm. But of course. Mm. But of course. <laughs> Can't do it all that. And that is why it kinda bothers me. When you go into restaurants and hotels in the Caribbean and you can't get the Caribbean foods, we don't want to serve breadfruit, we don't want to serve oil dough. You go in a hotel and ask for some roast breadfruit or something like that, they look on you like you're crazy. That's what I want. When you, when you go to live in New York and London and them kind of places, the amount of money you have to spend to get a little piece of roast breadfruit to eat. And I'm here in the Caribbean and can't get it. Well, I mean, you don't have to roast it. I mean, they could fry it. They can serve it other ways. It does yes. only one way to cook it, you see. Well, they could barbecue it. You know, put, you know, you could barbecue the breadfruit. Do something like that. That's what I think. <laughs> I say roast because I'm partial to roast breadfruit. Yeah. But, but, then, then, maybe, but then maybe they're not catering for you. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> they could still catering. They could still catering. But when I go to hotels or restaurants outside of the Caribbean, they're not catering for me either. Because I still can't get no bread fruit and, and no brown sugar. <laughs> <laughs> now you can get brown sugar. You can get brown sugar. Yeah. Brown sugar. That you can get. <laughs> that you can get. You know, you kind of like have this health kick now. So brown sugar is always on the so menu. brown sugar available. Yeah, if brown sugar can, available. If you can find the health conscious places, <laughs> so when we go, we can't find our cuisine anywhere. And when we are here, it's only in our own kitchen, we can't find it still. <laughs> that is something that we need to fix. Mm. Uh, I was very happy one morning when I went down to, to Blue Bay Resort. I have to call the name, George. I know you are Russ's good friend. And I asked the nice waitress for some meat tea. And I got some fresh meat tea. I was so happy. I have to go there for breakfast every day. I get minty. <laughs> now, which other restaurant can you go and ask for fresh minty and get it? No, I want to give you a coffee and some processed tea bag and what they call cocoa. Ah, 
Uh-uh. Oh, I'm minty. <laughs> I think Beverly, um, I think that the reason for that, one, what could be the reason for that, that there's no demand for our food because we don't demand our food in restaurant. We don't expect it to be served in restaurant. You know why? Because we're not proud of it. We are sure of what we eat. We are exactly. the food. Well, maybe yeah. too. Yeah, maybe that, yeah, that, that may be a, that may be a reason, but I think the other thing could be too. We don't think, you know. Yeah. We don't I think, think we can modify. That's why I say we could serve our bread food, but modify our bread food. We don't have to serve it the same way. The, the same way. We have different ways of cooking it and make it beautiful. Potato is nothing. But the thing that people make with potato, but they have no taste. But it's a horrible thing. But the thing that you could do with it, make modify, make it, you know, elevate, you know, I, I, even make it classic. I, I, I think the thing with going out for a meal too is kind of like you. You figure you want something different depending on where you are. So I mean, if you're you used to cook, eating you don't something cook at your home, yeah. Yeah, you know, so yeah. I mean, if you're going to go out yes. and kind of like eat the same thing that you eat at home, what's the point of, no. of, of going out, you know? I don't I mean, mind. I, I don't mind the specialist restaurants where you know you're going for Italian food or French food or Mexican or whatever. You have the restaurants that cater to those. But if I walk into a restaurant with a general open menu anywhere in the Caribbean, I expect to see something on the menu that reflects the Caribbean culture. It would be there. But the thing is that in, in, in restaurant is not that, you, don't, you, you want to sell the food that people don't you could cook at their, at their home. If I can cook food at my home, why would I go and spend money to buy it? You no, know, it, but you I, have a, listen. That's the point. So, Michael, you, Michael, feel free to jump in, you know. This is kind of like the crazy <laughs> conversations that we have, you know. Listen, these, are the crazy, these are the crazy conversations we have. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, Michael, you see? <laughs> <laughs> and Michael, Michael, if there's any way to uh, push your gain up a little bit, your volume up a little bit, because we're if you, if you have up. headphones. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, Catherine. By the way, by the way, um, by the way, Miss Miss Sinclair, Miss Breadfruit, and uh, what's the other one? Smoke Karen. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I noticed that uh, I was not included in tonight's lineup. Introduction. You, you noticed oh, that, huh? You noticed yes, that, eh, Catherine? Oh, really? you know, he left oh, George my out. goodness! Hey, but that's. What? Oh no! That's, that's I, okay. I have to I have to go and introduce him right now. The suspect at the control. Yeah. The one who makes it all happen. And he's wearing a red shirt, and I thought he was I right. know, right? We have to None comment on this because he does not like George red. Grant, <laughs> and every time we say thank you, George, for making Michael Chat happen. Beverly T. F. Richards on Facebook says he hopes that you enjoyed the live with P. M. Gonzalez this morning. He says it reminded him of Keith and Donald. I wonder who the Keith and Donald he talking about. I Sorry, I missed something you said. You hope there, live, there was a live with PM Gonzalez this morning. Oh, yes, I tuned into it. You know, about PM Gonzalez is a character, you know. That man must have been on the radio this morning about four or five hours. Well, after the first hour, you said, I have to find a way to pay the major finance the taxes. So I can't sit down and just listen to, to Gonzalez talking. Ralphie. So after about, after about the first hour, I had to take off, but I understand he had a rollicking time. He was on a radio station in St. Vincent. Oh, okay. Yeah, with a character called Bing, and he was just being Dr. Gonzalez. You know, he does what he does. And, and, and there's people, dead I'm silence. Sure people, people wanted to ask questions and jump in, but that conversation just kept going on and on and on. And sometime close to 12 o'clock when I checked, they were still going at it. And I'm like, wow. What? Wow, they must have started about 7.30 in the morning. So I managed to catch like the first hour from 7.30 to about 8.30. And I had to go. I had to pay my taxes. So, gee. Rafi, oh Rafi, so, bung away, man. Wow. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know. So there it was. But yes, back to our other menu. I was saying to Catherine that they, these restaurants are not catering to people who can cook, who cook at home. 
They are catering to the droves of people who come here that we call tourists. Definitely, yeah, yeah. And when you go to a different country, you would like to experience something different. You want to eat different foods. You want to see different things. And every now and then, if you can't find enough new foods to satisfy you, you look for a sign that says chicken somewhere. You have to go and find some chicken. If foods you're finding locally. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't find anything you like, but generally when people travel, they want to try different foods. They want to try the local food. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, if I go to Paris, I want to go on French food. I want to go on exactly. English food. I don't want my own food there. Let me ask you guys this question. I, I, I imagine that all of you travel a bit. It's, it's quite easy to find things like uh, smoke herring sauce in our local restaurants here in Grenada, right? I mean, you go Where? to... Where? Which ones? Uh, places like Dana's, for example, places mm -hmm. like Ando's mm -hmm. and so on. You, you find stuff. But I'm asking you, how many of you have ever gone into a hotel and seen smoke herring on the menu? No, you're not seeing it. And that goes yeah, back to what... Yeah, but it goes back to... That goes to what Catherine was saying a little while ago, that somehow it seems like we're ashamed of, uh, you know, what we have. Yeah. But you know... You know, ba actually, Bascom, Bascom, have you ever seen any? No, 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 I haven't. I haven't seen, um, you said the smoke herring. No, I have not seen that. Um, exactly. I, 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 I'm wondering if I've ever even seen saltfish, you know. Uh, yeah. No, you're not seeing exactly, that either. Exactly, exactly. But, but you see salmon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is what you're seeing. Yeah. Well, I, I I don't know. Um, a friend of mine mm -hmm. told me she lives she lives in Grenada, and she told me that she went to um Silver Sands, and um she was pleasantly surprised to find um local fare on the menu, and it was pretty good. I e Silver, local fare. I e Silver Sands. Silver yeah, Sands. I, Wait, Margaret. Silver mm -hmm. Sands has a Grenadian restaurant. Right, right. right. So she so said so she went there. Um, I think. There. She mentioned she did get breadfruit and they had done it a certain way. I know that was one of the things that she said and there were some other things that they had done. She said it was really good and she was really she was really impressed with it. So yeah. clearly yeah. you know. I've been, so that's I've been very impressed with the reports that I'm getting about uh yeah, 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 yeah. She yeah. had um yeah. and she she lives locally and she's kinda like one of these people who eats out a lot and you know, visit um those places. So Yeah. Yes, that is commendable, George. So that is one hotel where you can say you have a Grenadian restaurant. And I'm we're only assuming that they have that on the menu. Eh? Anyhow, TF on Facebook says, but folks, on a serious note, this is the type of thing I thought we would see on our menus of hotels and our islands. But sad to say, most don't. And I'm of the opinion that this should or is what tourists look forward to, but many times are left empty. So, Mr. Bascom, when next you come down here, go around to a couple of the hotels. I mean, as a world traveler, go around. They may listen to you, you know, say, hey, man, let me smoke Aaron, you know, let me saltfish. You know, Bass, try it. Oh boy! But you know, I. you know, I. They have their cons. They have their consultants who don't come from here, and all of the people who give them advice who don't come from here. You know, people would claim know the industry. Those are the ones they listen to. They don't. Know, I mean, they don't listen to the consumers in the industry. They listen to the people who know the industry. Yeah, but you know, I, but you know, Bev, I don't even think. I think you will probably find that in a lot of other places too, right? because I mean, particularly in areas where they're catering for quote unquote, you know, tourists, right? Because, and sometimes you as a traveler will have to like look for it. Because I remember a couple of years ago, um, we went to um, Cancun and, you know, we got off, we, we were doing this cruise and we got off the boat and, you know, we walked a little further in and, you know, along where everybody, where the tourists would sit. And we ran into some local folks and we said to them, look, you know, um, if you were 
going to eat lunch, you know, where would you eat? And the guy um, referred us to a local place and we went there and the food was great. We got local food. And we did the same thing. We did the same thing in Belize also. Um, you know, we got there and we pretty much um, asked people, you know, for a local place. And we went yeah. and we had local food. So, you know, people can, you know, there are places. And if, you know, if you're an, if, if you're an adventurous traveler and stuff, you would pretty much, you know, seek them out and find them. No, I do that too. That is something I will do when I go places. Yeah, yeah. I, like if I'm in a hotel, I'll say to the staff, okay, so where do you eat lunch? Mm -hmm. I want I want to have your lunch. I don't want to have the hotel lunch. Exactly. I want to find some real local foods to eat. Mm -hmm. But that is usually in the Caribbean. Because when you travel to certain countries and to certain areas, the food on the menu in the hotels, it's their food. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we need to come out our foods. Definitely. That's what we don't. Lydia James was saying, Wear me figure and smoke earring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, I had it all. Yeah. A few years ago in this country, we got a, they got a, um, a show called Master Chef. Mm -hmm. And I think it's somewhere in 2005. They, they, they had this show and there was this guy that came to the show from Trinidad. He got um, into the semi-final and you know what was his dish? He put dashing, planting, I think it was split peas and something else. And I was so proud to see that. I said, wow, that was fantastic. That's what you put on your table, dashing, I've never ever seen that. But you put that dashing that planted on the table. That was Would you mention that, Catherine? Because I remember watching one of those competitions as well. Mm. And the chef from St. Vincent won. And her winning dish was pillow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She cooked pillow. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. 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 That's because we, some of we saw a shame of our food. We don't, we don't really put, we could promote it, but we don't saw a shame of it. We don't, we don't like, we hide it, you see. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't feel proud of what we eat. That's yes. the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, and, and I know that there's been discussion here, you know, it's kind of like you have a, a certain Western construct of, about, you know, food and describing mm -hmm. food. And one of the things they like to slap is exotic or ethnic or those yeah. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know what's exotic or ethnic about a food, That's it. you know, That's and it. why is it applied to certain oh. foods or foods from anywhere other than like, the white West? Yeah, you yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another thing. Right, but well, folks, we spend the first part of the show chatting about food. So, although it's not yet quite time for the break, I think we should take the break and then when we come back, we're going to look at the situation in Venezuela. We'll touch on that a little bit before we get to sports. But before you go, um, Beverly, TF says here, the bottom line of this is what one of your hosts said, and I quote, we are not proud of our own, unquote. Mm -hmm. For example, look at Brooklyn and see who owns the so-called Caribbean grocery stores, Chinese, Koreans, etc. Definitely. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. True, Mags? It's true, but you know what? That's a whole nother discussion, eh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I agree with you, Margaret. Yeah, that's a whole other discussion that's mm -hmm. a lot more complicated than simply, you know, look at who owns it who yeah. Owns them. yeah 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 all right so, all right so go to my break right yes let's take the break and come back then we look at venezuela before we go to sports okay together with you our customers we energize our community together with you we energize our economy we are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our Spice Island. Friendlek, energizing our Grenada. 
Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates. 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. absolutely appreciate your company and very very happy for you to spend the time with us on a thursday evening we especially <laughs> welcome our guest suspect mr michael bascom we're going to be chatting some sports a little later on but before we get to that we just want to say a little bit about venezuela we're not going to say too much but we have to say something about venezuela venezuela is our neighbor in south America. Venezuela is a country that under the late president Hugo Chavez doled out a lot of money to Caribbean states. So he bought his way into the friendship. Venezuela bought its way into the friendship of CARICOM through its money. Because that's the only reason Venezuela became friends with CARICOM. That was done because Venezuela has always been an isolated country looking for political support. In fact, the ALBA agreement, if anyone ever takes the time to look at it, is an agreement which seeks to secure that kind of support, including military support, for Venezuela from these CARICOM countries. And when Chavez was putting that together, I don't know where he expects these countries to get military support from to give them enough. Jamaica has an army, and I don't think any soldier do anything where they help the police or things like that. Barbados, I also think, has an army. I stand for correction, but I believe Barbados has an army as well. Yeah, the defense force, yeah. Right. Yes. You're a Sakara Kambuano army, so I don't know where the military support uh, is. Well, except I think Bahamas. Bahamas. <laughs> Bahamas is part of Caracol? Yeah. On, pa on paper. On paper. Right. Yeah, yeah, on paper. Right. So let's keep, let's keep them. Another state of the US. <laughs> let them keep them. Exactly so. So let them keep them paper status. Whenever they're ready, we'll welcome them. But there is a Caracol no, no army. But that's the kind of thing that was included in Alba. So the countries would swear this kind of allegiance and this support for Venezuela. Mm -hmm. the, the, I, I would say the glue for that, of course, was Petra Caribe, which kept money flowing, no pun intended, into these countries. And when Petra Caribe began mm -hmm. to break away, that happened because of a number of a whole number of factors and circumstances caused that to happen. And really and truly, it was not Venezuela's wish for Petro Caribe to end. Because I am sure the late Chavez and now Maduro knew that once Petro Caribe went, there was really nothing except loyalty. And I dare say, loyalty and all of our PMs in the region just waiting for Venezuela to come back around to have money to give them again, you know? So they're there, they're hanging on, they're not doing anything. Because if they really cared about Venezuela and the people of Venezuela, their actions would be different. That is my opinion. I say so. You can take issue with me, not with anybody else in this chat room, and certainly not with George. I just believe they are very selfish, waiting for the money to start flowing. But be that as it may, the reality is that Venezuela is in crisis. 
there are many schools of thought on this. Some people say it's a plot by the U.S. to get rid of Maduro as president. And, uh, well, that, that is a prevailing thought. Oh, there. Well, it's, there. and and it's it's not it's not it's not it's it's rooted in in the fact that the U.S. did have an attempted coup back under Chavez. That that's that documented fact. So, it's it's rooted in that. It's 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 a clearly you know legitimate discussion. I mean, it's you know one can talk about the complications of that, but that's a legitimate discussion. And at the same time, the U.S. has more diplomats in Venezuela than the rest of the world put together, I could almost say. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a large number of diplomats in Venezuela at the same time. That again could be another whole discussion within itself. Who are these diplomats? Where are they? What do they do there? All of that could come into mm -hmm. a discussion. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, they are there. Um, so yeah. Yeah. You know, so here you have a country which is say, trying to insult the president and install someone else, but they have a whole set of diplomats down there. How how do you function as a diplomat if not with the president of the country, whoever that president is? You can't be a diplomat and be there sidelining the president and doing different things, not under diplomatic rules. Anyway, you know, so that's why I said that is for a whole different discussion, maybe not here. But, but um, just, just, um, I, I, the, well, what I heard late today mm -hmm. was the, um, that Maduro has um, closed the embassy in the Washington, D.C. and all consulates across the United States. And it, yeah, that, and, and yeah. this evening, yeah, this evening the U.S. ordered all non-essential personnel out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, but, but, Maduro but has expelled all the U.S. diplomats. Yeah, he yeah. did, but the, he did, but the U.S. ordered their non-essential personnel out, but they have left other. They haven't told the others to leave, so I don't know what's going to happen there. If he's going to physically pick them up and put them on the plane, and not, they, you know, what I'm saying. But but, but the, generally, the situation is that serious, and um, yeah. two things I want to say. One is that it's um, it's sort of very striking that as they've you know observed caricom seems to be very silent on that and um and two well uh, silent in terms of how they're voting you know mm -hmm. especially those, those who decide to absent and abstain and all these other things and then also um the concern that um the, the, the people of venezuela um will suffer and you know i thought about it today and i said you know when you heard about the warnings by China and um, Russia, you know, especially Russia in, on the military point of view, because they said, you know, to the US, please don't think about any military intervention. And then we recall just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, they sent their bombers and, you know, all these sort of military arsenal in, um, mm -hmm. in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as a show of support to, to, to um, um, in solidarity with Maduro, you know, my concern about that is that I hope Venezuela doesn't turn out to be a Syria. Because remember, exactly. mm -hmm. just started, mm -hmm. everyone wanted Assad to be out. Yes, <laughs> yes. Still there. Mm -hmm. After he's still there, mm -hmm. and all these bombings and, you know, whatever it is, you know. Because they, they can't bomb him out. Yeah. You can't bomb him out. It's the same yeah. thing with Iran. You cannot, in Iraq, sorry, you cannot bomb the leader out. You just can't. Yeah, and you realize all the countries that we have attempted at what has happened after that, the civil war and everything, Libya, yeah, and you just, you know, um, yeah. Iraq, you know, you know, Syria, you know, with all the factions, you know, and um, <laughs> Venezuela, as you know, is probably one of the Latin American countries that is heavily militarized, you know, mm -hmm. yes. and, uh, you know, it's something, it seems as if Maduro is really entrenched, especially with the military, Mm -hmm. All for now, yeah. they have come mm -hmm. out, the generals have come out, and they have mm -hmm. shown support. And it seems as if that is the level that he will be um, operating from once he has the military and the support of the generals and the armed forces in general. It appears that uh, he will entrench his position in Caracas. All right, Michael, there's something I want to ask. 
Something I want to uh, ask you, Michael, but first I want to read a comment here. Somebody on Facebook says, I agree with your opinion. CARICOM is a hypocritical organization, and Grenada is not left out in the hypocrisy. Look at the dishonorable Speaker of the House and the recently posted ambassador to CARICOM. Just visited Venezuela officially, or unofficially, but when it was time to vote Grenada, sorry, excuse me, when it was time to vote, Grenada abstained. Who's fooling who? So but says you know, the But to address that, that, that whole abstention or, or disappearing act. Absent. Um, <laughs> that too, right? The toilet but, act. But, but if you look at the Caribbean. Excuse me. The Caribbean excuse me. Here. Now you go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, if you look at the Caribbean in general and their voting record, even at the United Nations, they are famous for not voting or abstaining from votes and stuff. So, you know, Venezuela is not the first time that they have done that. that well, that's a consistent pattern of Caribbean countries. They either abstain, you're right, or take a bathroom break or just don't show up. Because you remember with Cuba and Israel, the issue yes. with Cuba and Israel, mm -hmm. Caricom mm -hmm. has always been disjointed. Sometimes mm -hmm. they supporting it sometimes they are still mm -hmm. you know, like that so, no, so it's but not listen, to this, listen to this guys a news report on caribbean news service leaders from across the caribbean community met via video conference today thursday in a special emergency meeting to discuss the ongoing crisis in venezuela talk about hypocrisy here is some more while CARICOM is yet to issue an official position on the situation, but it can't. Several countries in the region have already taken a stance on the crisis in the South American nation. And that's why CARICOM can't, because the CARICOM countries have already individually expressed their positions, or not. So what is CARICOM going to say? Right? And the story goes on in the case of Jamaica, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says the government is close to monitoring the situation. The latest developments. Jamaica vote with for whatever the OAS says against Venezuela, right? Oh. But meeting with CARICOM to discuss the Venezuela situation nonetheless. Diana says it is gravely concerned at the beginning on the of the political crisis and the government of Guyana, which has its own problems right now. Yeah. They to do. I haven't heard it yet, but they have issued something about 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 venezuela right yesterday we know that the opposition leader declared himself the interim leader of guyana and and venezuela. Venezuela. sorry venezuela yeah forgive me guyana people of venezuela <laughs> right and then nicolas maduro with the support of the army and others you know he's still there as president but just to put a little bit of clarity on this opposition leader team. The opposition leader heads the National Assembly, which he claims right now is the only properly elected and constituted house in Venezuela. And because of that, it's on that premise that he has declared himself president, because the argument, of course, is that President Maduro was not properly elected in the last election yeah, so, yeah. Right. that is a controversy which i am sure will play out more in the coming days but the fact of the matter is the the, the wishy-washy wishy-washy nest in caricom continues with this emergency meeting that they had to do because it can't be a meeting to come to a consensus everybody already took their side so what are they discussing? And I'm sorry that the report what I was looking at today didn't tell me what they were discussing and what is the way forward coming out of this meeting. Practically just said that they meant more waste of time. But you know, sometimes I, I mean, maybe maybe I'm being naive, but you know, sometimes I'm just just looking at the situation in, in, in Venezuela. I mean, can't you just simply say look? Clearly there is a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. So simply make an appeal to the guy on that basis and say, look, step aside. 
I mean, in, you understand what I'm saying? You're not so you're not basically condemning somebody if that is what you're trying to avoid doing. But just in the basis no, of listen. pure humanity. Mm-hmm. And listen, that's why I say maybe I'm being maybe I'm being naive. You know, but any any appeal for humanitarian support will be an admittance that the presidency of Nicolas Maduro has failed. And there is no way any of his care from friends is going to say that he's failed. So they will not make that appeal. Mm-hmm. We have we have said it here on Metro Chat before. Why is it that we can't do like we do after a hurricane hits somewhere where we get together humanitarian supplies and troops and send them to help the people of Venezuela? Not the president. The president will need anybody to help in that way. But why can't we go on a humanitarian mission to assist the people of Venezuela who have given to us so much? Because it's their money that Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro has taken out and given to CARICOM and the OECS. It's their money. Why can't we have a heart and help these people? And we haven't. Because in doing so, we would be saying, Nicolas Maduro, you're failing. The country is in shambles. The country is in a mess. So we don't. So we can dress up and go down there and pontificate and stand up in hearing in ceremony and, and support the presidency and the one from voting in the OAS. We can do all of that. But we cannot do anything that is going to demonstrate that the country is in shambles. Because even now, I am sure there are two people in, in the OECS. Senator Chester Humphrey and Speaker of the House in St. Vincent, Joma Thomas. Those two people will put a neck on the black and the particular person around in Venezuela. Right in right. They and there are others like them. All right. But it's, interesting, it's interesting that today Mike Pompeo announced a $20 million package aid package to Venezuela, $20 million? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, $20 million? Yes. No, nah, man, come on. Mm-hmm. I, I think, um, you know, even the opposition in Venezuela should denounce that. Mm-hmm. Even the opposition who is clamoring, $20 million, <laughs> that, that's the hypocrisy of that. What, $20 million? Come on, man. Peanuts. I mean, that. There are reports that 25% of the population Gone. Which would translate to millions. Yeah, gone. Mm-hmm. Out. Mm-hmm. You know, anybody in Venezuela who can be practically have and those who are there. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure you guys do know people. I mean, I know people who have families there and who have been begging for funds to send stuff for their family. I mean, I know personally people people there. There's a government minister in Grenada in particular who has relatives there. And I know for a fact that the family members here send stuff to Venezuela on a frequent basis for those relatives. I have a good friend whose wife is from Venezuela and she says the reason she's able to assist her relatives is that they don't live on the mainland, they live on the smaller islands of Venezuela. So she's able to get stuff to them on the right. island. Right. But when you try to venture onto the mainland, that's a totally different story. Mm. It's not easy. It's not easy. Michael, I was gonna because, I was gonna ask a little while ago, Michael. You know, where do you see this going? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a confusing situation now. Mm-hmm. It's one it's very, very confusing, and it's very fluid in that every day something is taking place. I mean, you would have seen the, the videos of the, the, the opposition, you know, rally. I think it was, well, I saw mm-hmm. it today, so I don't know if it was yesterday mm-hmm. or what. But, um, it was on Wednesday. That was on Wednesday, Wednesday. right. Mm-hmm. And um, and you're hearing from Maduro today that you know he, he basically is not going anywhere, yeah, and you're hearing from other nations that throwing support to the opposition or throwing support to Maduro. Um, mm-hmm. 
it appears that uh, even the Vatican, for example, um, today issued a statement basically calling for a resolution to the um, the crisis, even though the Pope is just next door in Panama, you know. And um, what, what's as it, no, it appears that, um, as you to answer your question, um, it's very difficult to say where this will go unless there is some, you know, merging by one of the either the opposition or Maduro, and it appears that no one is about to budge. Michael, oh, Michael mentioned the Pope. Sorry, George. T.F. Richard says, Michael, that's the start of America's effort to rid the Caribbean of the last so-called communist regime. Look out. Lots more to come. Now, today I came across, I came across an article in the South Morning China Post. Are you guys familiar with that publication? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And I pulled out three excerpts, and I just want to, sh three short excerpts, and I just want to share them with you guys. Somebody by the name of Dong Zhengshen, he's the deputy director of Peking's University Latin America Research Center, said, China was keeping an uneasy eye out for a regime change in Venezuela because it was not clear how the crisis would play out. The second one, Maduro is not likely to step down voluntarily but Beijing is worried about a possible regime change, especially the prospect of Guaido not honoring deals signed between China and Maduro's government. Mm -hmm. China has already loaned 50 billion US dollars to Caracas over the last decade, which the South American nation has been repaying in oil shipments, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And yep. finally, but even if Maduro was forced out or stood down, I can expect some continuity in Venezuela's economic and trade relations with China because China will remain one of Venezuela's largest markets for its oil, said Mr. Dong. China would not want to hurt its all-important ties with the U.S. because of its economic and investment interests in Latin America. Hmm? All right, so you can read between the lines. That is why the crisis is so complex. Yeah. Oh, and Michael, you had mentioned the Pope. I wanted to jump in there to just to point out how divided the Catholic Church is on the Venezuela issue, because the Pope is taking one position and the Catholic churches in Venezuela are on a completely different page. And they're not, they're not making no secret of it. So there's a big division, even within the Catholic church, as far as its support or non-support for the Maduro presidency is going. So. Which is not surprising because it has been characteristic of the Catholic church in Latin America and South America. There's always been a split ideologically so it's it's not surprising you know to to see that happening now yeah yes but where do we see this going that's a very interesting question that george had asked yeah well the security, the security council the u.n security council i think is meeting an emergency on saturday to discuss that crisis in venezuela so again and i think was actually called by the U.S., but you know, any major um, action would obviously be vetoed by Russia and probably China. You know, one when it comes mm -hmm. up to these sort of things, but it will be interesting to see what's coming out of that. You know? Yeah, and and it's it's not one of those problems that the U.S. can solve with a war. You know, uh, <laughs> with, with something else. <laughs> You know, suddenly I just brought a smile to my face that Michael mentioned an emergency meeting being held on Saturday. Emergency meeting. Today is Thursday, Michael. Friday, Saturday. Yeah. I guess you got to round up the troops, right? Yeah, I guess as much as because um, it was announced Thursday afternoon, evening, they mm -hmm. consider in terms of having it Saturday. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. as close as they could get it. Yeah. Laurie Bridgman says, remember October 19th, 
1983. Food for Tough Venezuela. Next watch. So it says Lori. Lori, I'm not sure I understand, but go ahead, folks. What I would take away from that is, is she's probably concerned that there could be an implosion of some sort in Venezuela. But the country is on the brink of a civil war, I believe. Here, in my mind, I could see that happening. Easily. Well, that's what I saw, and that's the reason why I asked Michael the question I did a little while ago. Where did he see this going? You know, I didn't want to put words in his mouth, but uh, I mean, I think the writing's on the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It will happen, except something else happens. It's just really, really very, very unfortunate that one of the countries that used to be at the peak is now just, again, you know, very this, shambling. Yeah, but you know what? Then again, this type of, um, you know, unrest and things in, in Venezuela is not unusual. It's, it's, it's part of that country's history. Have any of you yeah. seen the statement that was issued by uh, Cuba uh, sometime this afternoon, the Cuban embassy? No? I'll, ex I'll expect the Cubans to pr provide Cuba and probably Bolivia among countries in Latin America that I would support yeah. Maduro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, Cuba is one of the most concerned about Venezuela, you know, because Venezuela is it only source of oil for Cuba because of Cuba's position with the U.S. embargo they cannot just up and buy oil from anywhere so Venezuela has been the country that keeps Cuba fuel so of all the nations in the region and perhaps in the world Cuba is one country that would not want to see anything untoward in Venezuela because they depend on Venezuela for okay let me let me read that statement Beverly it it's captioned revolutionary government declaration aggression against Venezuela must cease it says the revolutionary government of the Republic of Cuba condemns and energetically rejects the attempt to impose a coup d'etat a puppet government at the service of the United States in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and expresses its unwavering solidarity with the government of constitutional president Nicolas Maduro Moros. The revolutionary government of the Republic of Cuba condemns and energetically rejects the attempt to impose a coup d'etat. The true objectives of actions against Venezuela are to control the vast resources of the sister nation and destroy the value of its example as an emancipatory process defending the dignity and independence of our America. As President Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez said, quote, the sovereignty of our peoples is expressed today in one's attitude towards Venezuela. To support the legitimate right of the sister nation to define its own destiny is to defend the dignity of all." Unquote. Other coup d'etat attempts should not be forgotten, such as the military coup of 2002 and 2003, oil lockout, the aggressive U.S. executive order describing Venezuela as an unusual and extraordinary threat to national security and foreign policy of the superpower. Unilateral coercive measures. The call for a military coup against the constitutional government of Venezuela. The President of the United States is threat to use a possible military option. And the 4th of August assassination attempt against President Maduro. Finally, the acts of a group of countries and the shameful role of the OAS constitute a new desperate attempt 
to implement an unsuccessful policy of regime change, which has not been imposed due to the unwavering resistance of the Venezuelan people and their determination to defend national sovereignty. Hmm. And it is along the line of exactly what you would expect to come out of Cuba in support of Venezuela. You know, but the, it's an issue that has split the Caribbean by country and within countries there is further split on the issue of Venezuela. Another thing we make for the opposition has taken a totally different view what the ruling party has on Venezuela and other countries. There are just diverse views among people in leadership and in certain positions on Venezuela. So the region has a long way to go in coming together if there is to be any consensus in Caracom and Venezuela, which I'm not holding my breath, but they called the meeting today for what? I don't know. They have all made their positions clear one way or the other. They have made their positions clear. But it is uh, one thing we know. One thing we know, the people in Venezuela they need help at the humanitarian level. Mm -hmm. Basic things, food, toothpaste, toilet paper, stuff like that, just not available in Venezuela right now. And if there is any way, any way that can be found to help those people, that is probably what some effort should be concentrated on because the geopolitical warfare is not going to end anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And the people are in need. Mm -hmm. The situation, the, the people's lot gonna get worse. Huge companies are filled out, people not working. There is no money. Nicolas Maduro announced recently that he was increasing minimum wage 300%, like, really? 300% of zero is zero, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So this, so the situation with the people there, they, they are in dire need of help. And where I, where I sit, that is where I'd be looking to put some effort to see if there is any way. If you know people in Venezuela, or you know anyone, you know anyone in Venezuela, I know how you can reach out and assist those people, whether it's with food, whether it's with drugs, whether it's with any sort of thing that can make your life a little better. Have you heard of any in, uh, relief initiatives, Bev, uh, announced by the local embassy or anything? No, no. It's what we said earlier. If there is any national relief effort by any country, it's going to be an admittance that the Maduro regime regime is in trouble and is in shambles and because of that our people in leadership position will stay away from launching any such effort isn't that pathetic they do, not, they do not want to admit that the regime has failed isn't that pathetic it is you know it is so Rit all is sacrificed on the political altar Facebook is saying here, what is surprising to a lot of the news agencies covering the issue is the amount of people that are actually turning out to protest. The number is unprecedented, so says Facebook. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, I've heard comments about that. Mm -hmm. I've heard comments uh, about Laurie that. Bridgman, I'm reading this now for the first time, just came in. Laurie Bridgman says, it was the young members of Central Committee that takes orders in their own hands that turn things around and turn things around in Grenada. Things will unfold just like home in Venezuela. Sorry to say. And uh, I think <clears throat> even closer to home in terms of Grenada should be a bit concerned. I know Trinidad in itself because uh, the humanitarian aspect of it. Um, we are already seen a lot of reports where Venezuelans themselves have been turning up on the shows of, um, of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. 
And um, mm -hmm. obviously, if they've been turned away, then what say you, Grenada, and probably even St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, there, there must be some level of concern, some level of vigilance, some level of, you know, um, the humanitarian aspect of it we have to look at as well, because we know even before this major crisis as it is that has developed over the past week or two, there were thousands of Venezuelans who already fled Venezuela and have gone to other countries, um, you know, I think some of them reached as far as, you know, Guatemala and all these places. They have been, you know, Colombia, for example, you know, and, and these places where they have, you know, tents set up for a lot of Venezuelans who have actually fled, you know, mm -hmm. and some of them have even threatened, some countries have even threatened to close their borders, you know. Mm -hmm. so you know I expect if, does not, if this situation does not resolve soon, that the whole humanitarian aspect of it, people um, believing that something may happen, you know, fleeing for, you know, political persecution, as you may call it, economic reasons, whatever it is, may just, it may just create a whole, you know, major problem, I think, especially in Latin America. You know, Michael, you're referring to Trinidad and the fact that, yes, I think that what got something like 40,000 of them in Trinidad already? Yeah. 40,000. Michael, yeah, Michael, has, uh, you know, Michael, there has been quite a few. You know, there is not just, okay. there is not just a possibility. I would be very, very surprised if there aren't already a lot of these people sitting right here in Grenada. I would be very surprised. We do not have the level of security that yes. Trinidad has. Okay, yes. these people can Especially. come in here. I mean, come on. The inlets, yeah, a lot of the inlets and things like that are not heavily guarded, yeah. and, you know, because of how it is, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, it's challenging even for a Coast Guard. You know, many times they act on tip offs and things like that, so, you know, but um, I wouldn't be surprised, as you say, that, um, you know, a lot of them may have flee and found places, haven somewhere in the island. Yeah. You know, um, we have, the, the authorities have to remain vigilant, you know, and probably has a, they, they must look at it also as a means of setting up a process just in case they show up or they are intercepted. How do you process them? How do you deal with that, you know? Um, so we can't wait until it starts happening, but we, might, we need to start putting something in place just in case. And, and it has been happening, so I agree. Mm -hmm. Michael's audio went, or is it just me not hearing him? I just heard him. Yeah, we heard him. I think... Yeah, I'm hearing him. Yeah, I think okay. your audio had a problem. Your, your, I think you're, you're muted. You're muted yes, for once. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, it was me. But George, let's take our next break, and then when we come back, we're gonna talk some physical activity that's supposed to get you moving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Beverly, 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 Beverly. With free island-wide delivery, Hubbard's building supplies and lumber departments continue to provide the best quality lumber, steel, tiles, plumbing materials, electrical, and general hardware supplies at competitive prices. We continually consult with builders, homeowners, and contractors to improve product range and services. Enjoy discounts where applicable, including the use of credit and debit cards. At Hubbard's building supplies, Grand Dance, and lumber department, Caronage, we offer quality service, affordable prices, giving you the convenient reliable free island-wide delivery call 440-2087 for all your home improvement and building solutions
folks, welcome back. We're still here, counting down inside Mecca Chat with some of the usual suspects and our guest suspect, Mr. Michael Baxter. He is a former sports journalist. Let me say that again. Let me come off that. A former sports journalist. Good. I see a lot of our journalists, you know, when they want to say former, they say formal. Like, like they would say, Michael formally wrote sports. <laughs> Bev, what I'm, what I'm curious about is that I didn't know he was a former sports journalist. I thought he was. When did you retire, Mr. Oh, Bascom? Me, not from what I see. <laughs> when did you retire? Um, it's it's similarly like they say, once you're a driver, you always may remain a driver. <laughs> Until your license you're expires. Never, you never undrive yourself. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's why I was so specific when I said he's still an enthusiast. Can't get that out of his blood. But as far as being that sports journalist that he used to be, I think he has picked up hat and wearing different hats that he's here so I, I won't talk about him like I'm talking about him behind his back you know he's right here <laughs> 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 so Michael Beer I have noticed that one of the one medium that you use is Facebook which is one of the popular social sites social media sites and you have been saying a lot about Grenadian athletes who are doing well getting some contracts, winning some races, you know, do, showing off and making making very, very good news of themselves overseas. And one of the reasons I'm happier here is that maybe you could hone in a bit on probably one or two of these athletes, maybe if you can give us a little background on where they came from and how they got to where they are and flying that red, green and gold out there in the U.S. and probably elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, and I think it's interesting enough in that um, since 2011, when Kirani James um, broke onto the scene globally, even prior to that, we had Aline Francic, for example, in the um, the world, winning World Indo titles back to back. But obviously, the, the, the World Indo, it, it does not, um, you know, gather that sort of... Um, public attention, media attention, global attention, by the way, as probably uh, a, a world championship or even an Olympic Games. And I think since then, uh, 2011 and then 2012 in London, I, I, I think there, was, there has been this upsurge of interest, especially among track and field, um, both athletes and fans uh, um, regarding Grenada. And there's always been the talk about who, what next, who's next, you know? But we know what had happened to Kirani within the last year or two, especially with that injury. Um, well, medical in particular, not to say that he had, um, you know, he contracted an injury, so, you know, things like that. So, And um, there has been the talk about who are these young athletes, who are these young athletes up and coming that probably can be a replacement, rival Kirani, whatever it is you may think of. And... Um, I think we have experienced a sort of drought for a period of time. But within the last year or so, practically two years, I think, we have had a, a group of athletes, um, primarily, and I, I'm talking about track because we also had to feel athletes like the Lyndon Victor and Kurt Felix and others. But we had a group of track athletes <clears throat> who came out from the St. Andrews area, St. Sass in particular. And it appears that, you know, no one or the authorities in Grenada, you know, you know, had, well, I mean, you know, I, I am free to say what I have to mm -hmm. say now, had no interest in these athletes up here. Because, mm -hmm. you know, speaking to their coach and understanding the amount of appeals he has made over the period of time, to try to get some attention for these athletes. And uh, it just happened that, you know, last year that in his, you know, constant appeal and this time outside of Grenada, that 
a college decided to assist these guys. And we have at least three of them in one college in the United States, Monroe College. Then there's another one in Tennessee. And there are a number of other athletes, young athletes who have just gained scholarships. And by the way, most of these scholarships are either directly with the, the colleges or their parents would have been you know, a part of it in terms of supporting. So they probably would have gotten a half scholarship from the college and then their parents would have, you know, put the rest towards that and things like that. So, and there is now a cadre of track and field athletes who basically driving the process, driving the attention of Grenada when it comes to uh, track and field, not just at the college level, but on the global scene. And I think, um, the, the letdown in all of that has been the lack of support, the lack of appreciation sometimes. I, I know not all the time you will be in a position to give something financially, but speaking to these athletes sometimes is just the attention, just the, the appreciation, knowing that they're out there representing Grenada. And sometimes, whether it's Christmas, whether it's New Year, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, not even the courtesy of a call, um, how are you making it out? How are you doing? Is everything okay? Nothing, you know, and they're just out there. And I think to an extent, um, that is one of the issues and you would have seen I've been writing about the lack of attention and lack of appreciation of, um, of our athletes and what they are doing. And on the other hand, um, trying to help the others who are there and looking for opportunities, um, you know, you, you hear a lot about scholarships, whether it's to be a doctor, whether to be this, whether to be that. How many scholarships do you have for individuals who are willing to do something in sports, whether it's sports medicine, sports administration, sports management, whether it's to go out on a scholarship as, you know, on a, a sports scholarship, more or less. We don't hear much about that. We, we hear all sorts of scholarships from all over. And, you know, I, I, just, I, you know, I understand, you know, we take what we get, but at the same time, who advocating to assist these um, young men and women who are destined to be the next Kiran James, Arlene Francie, you know, and, and by the way, and not only track and field, whether it's football, swimming, um, you know, whatever it is, whatever sporting discipline, because just for me to make one other point there, we have a situation where the, our main tertiary institution, that of the T.A. Marshall Community College, does not have a, a sports department, a structured sports department. So you will find the sportsman and sportswoman from the various secondary schools will perform exceptional at the intercall championships or the basketball or netball or whatever. And they go into the Tam TC, and that's the end of their sporting career because there isn't any continuity. <laughs> because Tam CC as a tertiary institution does not have a sports program. And, you know, they, they do not even participate regularly in any of the sporting competition. Unlike some of the islands where they have probably two, three tertiary institutions, they can have competition among themselves. But you find where a lot of these young, 16 year olds, 70 year olds, good academics, good sporting ability, whether it's netball, cricket, whatever, but because of that lack of sporting structure within the tertiary institution, particularly Tam CC, that's the end of them. So they give it up altogether. So it's just the one or two who probably will remain steadfast, who will probably move on from the high school, the secondary school, probably straight to a college or something like that, because they have one or two who did that this year. They left high school. They did not go to Tam CC. They left their secondary school and they went into a junior college here in the United States because if they have probably took the step and go into Tam CC, they probably thought that would have been the end of their progress in terms of track and field. Um, so that, that to me, some of the, the, the concerns, even though we have a cadre of track and field athletes now out here who are doing pretty well. And by the way, not only in the United States, we also have those in, in Jamaica. I have been writing about a few of them in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. They have decided to do their sixth form in Jamaica. So after graduating from SASA, graduating from the GBSS, they went into Edwin Allen, for example, to do their second year or their sixth form there. 
They went into Kingston College, these two schools in particular. And I think all of that had to do with the determination of the athletes, the assistance of their coaches, and their parents supporting them as well. You know what's really oh troubling, Michael? Uh, <laughs> this is really troubling. You know, you're talking about uh, failure as a people to reach out to the athletes. And uh, interestingly, you're not talking financially. You're talking about other means which really don't cost that much money. A phone call, maybe a letter, an email. How you doing, bro? We'll go. You know, there could people could argue and say, well, Grenada does not have the monetary resources to give to these people. I can understand that. I can understand that. But there's just something about the Grenadian mindset that we really don't support our own. And Catherine was bunging away along those lines earlier on, and she's done it over and over on this program. The fact that we're just lacking something in our mindset that is so valuable and cost virtually nothing. Just being there for people. Um. Yeah, I, and, and just to follow up on, I had a question, Michael, just to follow up on what George said too. Um, why do you think um, there's that lack of interest on the part of the public and certainly the support from government as well? And is that in any way related to um, coverage of sports in Grenada and, uh, you know, in the media? Yes, to an extent. Um, you, you tend to, f I, I, and I'm, I'm being honest about it, uh, it seems to an extent, and let me just briefly on the media in terms of that, the, the interest seems to be when there is a big event um, and not so much so on, you know, the quote-unquote smaller events. So, for example, um, last week we had cricket in Grenada. And that's why I'm saying not just track and field athletes. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we're looking at sportsmen and sportsmen in general. The crop of the Windward Islands team, the likes of the Devon Smith and the Sherman Lewis who plays for West Indies and, you know, the Roland K2, et etc. The best of Grenada's cricketers on show. And playing against Jamaica, which also included West Indies players. And there was just a lack of interest. Mm -hmm. A lack of interest among the public and others, you know? And I, I'm just using that. However, let's say, well, I'm not even sure if, well, West is doing something now. So, um, uh, you know, I wanted to say, but <laughs> the big stars, the big stars up here. <laughs> everyone wants to be there. Everyone is, 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 is um, everyone becomes an authority on it. Everyone speaking as if they have been there, they know everyone, you know? things like that so and I, i'm saying that we have a we show a lack of appreciation for even our up and coming stars the the, the, the grenada athletics association had four mini meets within the past few months including last weekend there was one at the kirani james athletic stadium i was looking at the videos and i'm telling you it was very disappointing to see the lack of interest shown by the public to see our athletes compete, our own Grenadian athletes competing. And by the way, we'll come on to that in a while. This, some of the same athletes who we're hoping to see at the quote-unquote um, branded intercall. So when you hear a lot of folks talking about the intercall and the support and they support the children and the children suffering and these sort of things like that, so it's rubbish. <laughs> because that is where they're supposed to support them and not yeah. just at intercall. Yeah. Why? The, yeah, yeah. The, the event was basically free. <laughs> it was basically free. And I have the, vid the videos are there. And when you look at it, and I'm seeing this, some of these same people all over social media, about they care so much about these athletes and the children suffering and this and that. Oh, because it's intercall. And you know, for most of them, intercall for them is on the final day, mm -hmm. probably with the last mm -hmm. two the last two events, events the relays. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in a while. But I'm just telling you that to me, and it comes back to your question, Margaret, and also answering George's um point, the lack of interest. 
So mm -hmm. sometimes it's not most so much so the finance, you know, the money, but the support, and not just government, but even from the public, even from those who are clamoring to be, you know, supporting them and wanting to see them succeed. And this is where you volunteers and those clamoring to be volunteers. Volunteers, yeah. This is where you have to support them. This is where you have to show them the support. As they yeah. always said, that is where the Kirani James and others started. They started running at these local needs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and we yeah. have to. You know, Michael, this is exactly why I began with, with this discussion on sports, where I began with this new crop of athletes that I have only seen you. And I use report loosely because I know you're not exactly reporting, you just sharing your passion with the rest right. of us well, and, and yeah. sharing, sharing the information as well you know um, exactly so and i look at i look at it and i say now here's another young crop of grenadian athletes that are coming up making a name for themselves out there and how do we hear about it we hear about it from michael on a social media platform okay. and that's the only news we hear about it because i am not even bothering michael with when people pick it up and go back and say it like it is something that they know i say oh but that's michael's report i read it today <laughs> you know so yeah. i am not even bothering with those i am saying the only place you hear about these things is when you go on michael's page or you see it pop up in your news feed if you follow michael and you see these reports but michael then Michael, here's a, a theory to further what you were saying a little while ago. T.F. Richard says, it's all about politics, if you ask me. We as a people look for kickbacks. What's in it for us? If you ask for sponsorship, it's another crying story. And if this one is not involved, then it can't work. No, Michael, it's not rubbish. It's politics and politics <laughs> and right and look at these athletes who are out there and i know and any thinking any sensible person will know that when you see an athlete recognized by a coach and getting a scholarship and getting to run with a team or to represent a college in the u.s it's not because he was sitting down in some back room in saint andrew and the coach gets an epiphany and say, oh, let me go to St. Andrew for this young man. It's because he's out there showing his skill, trying, doing his best. And who supports him in that initiative? I'm glad Michael talked about the disconnect between secondary school and tertiary education because many young athletes, their dream die after they graduate secondary school. And they find they have to go out there on their own. Young people, probably with parents who know nothing about how to break into the world of sports, how to become a professional athlete, they don't know. And you have these organizations that are set up, which are supposed to be giving this kind of technical support to the athletes, to the young athletes, to help them to advance their careers once they have the talent, once they have the interest. There shouldn't be anything to hold them back. But they don't get it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you hear how much, you know, we love them, we care about them, we want the best for them. But this neglect and disconnect with the athletes is not just something which began with this new crop that Michael has identified up there and is reporting on. It started a long time. Aline Francis went out there and made, did his thing. And when he began to break records and to win medals and his name was being called, all of a sudden you hear his radio. Well, you know, the flag start I, to fly. I, I, I you made that point because, you know, <coughs> I covered Francis when he started here. As a matter of fact, he started at Essex Junior College in New Jersey, but I was in Grenada at the time. And Francie told me once that when he came to the United States the first time, he came to the college, 
He had a fifty dollars, fifty US dollars in his pocket. That was all he had in his pocket. He basically left Grenada with nothing. You know, in those days, when you're traveling, and they, 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 you know, they'll ask you how much money you have, you know, these sort of things. And depending on what you show and thing, they will determine whether or not you, you know, they should be allowed. And he said he was scared, you know, he was scared because that's all he had. You know, you don't wonder if he says fifty dollars, and then they say no, they're probably hiding money somewhere, you know, things like that, you know. Uh, but I'm just, you know, letting you know how some of these athletes who have moved on you know and done great things how they have struggled you know mm -hmm. i know who have athletes i mean sad to say who came here and didn't make it into the system because of the lack of support unfortunately they didn't make it mm -hmm. uh, they, they, in fact as i speak to you there's one athlete who returned home l late last year because there wasn't the level of assistance and this the athlete parent was not in a position to assist you know and, yeah and you know these are the these are the sort of things that they encounter at times and sometimes it has it has to do with how things are done they probably promise this they promise that and then when they get there it's a different scenario and things like that but all because there isn't a support system there isn't anything in Grenada that will let them know of how to go about doing this or doing that mm -hmm. and um and sometimes they just they, out of really wanting to do something they take the chance you know mm -hmm. they want to you get an opportunity and uh, you, you know parents are so excited about you going and hopefully getting this opportunity to improve yourself and things like that so you know they even t go as far as taking out a loan to assist you but then that is as much as they can do you know yeah. I think like that and i know of some who went through that and unfortunately could not have continued and i'm speaking about um those in track and field i i know of someone who in volleyball i know of somebody in football and there are, you know others who you probably did not hear about but then when you actually investigate you know it's because of some situation and that by the way and that's why to some of them who would have been who came here did it on their own and refused to return yeah <laughs> they did mm -hmm. you know it's like, like a slap in their face you never assisted mm -hmm. me while well, well, going back and you know i have no reason to go back to help you, you know? give back and yeah. you talk about it track i was on my own you talk about the track athletes, you talk about the field athletes. Grenada has always had a brilliant crop of swimmers. Dominate the OECS over yeah, and over yes. year over after year. Yeah, yeah. Have yeah. we ever heard of any Grenadian swimmers really getting beyond the OECS championships? Well, that's true. Uh, we haven't um, yet, and I, I want to applaud the effort of um, Ori Cherubin, her, her entire family, who have been very that's supportive family of her. Effort, really. yeah, that's family because, effort. It's a family and, effort. And, and the, we, we also have to, you know, um, single out the, the Swimming Association, because, mm -hmm. you know, in the context of what they have been doing with what they have, <laughs> you know, you have a 25 mm -hmm. meters swimming pool, and um, you have been basically the, the top the top dog of swimming mm -hmm. in the OECS. Um, to be. Yeah, albeit, you know, and you still go outside of the OECS and the Caribbean Championships, winning medals, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, and you're looking at competing against the likes of Jamaica, Bahamas, Trinidad, you know, um, Barbados, and these islands have world-class facilities. Exactly. And Grenada has a, a what? A, how many lanes? Probably four 20, lanes in a 20, twenty-five. 25 in a twenty-five meter pool. That 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 twenty-five meter pool is extinct. In fact, that is a warm-up um, pool for many that's other a countries. Quarter, a quarter the length. Yes, yeah, they actually that, yeah. that is when you finish swim, you jump in that to just relax yourself. Oh you know? Yes. Yeah. And that is that is our main facility. And years over, after years, the swimmers have been promised facilities 
and they have been doing well, you know. Mm -hmm. I believe they can do better if they yeah. get the facility. Mm -hmm. But I think, I you know, think I'm, sorry, go ahead, Margaret. No, I, I, I think it's going back, I'm still going back to the point where I think, granted that there isn't the support and the interest there that you would like it to be, but I wonder how much of that, though, is because people don't know. Um, you know, and if people don't know, they can't have an interest in something that they don't know. Michael said that, you know, he began to cover um, fancy, you know, long before he was who he was. And maybe we need to see more of that coverage. Um, I seem to remember a time when, you know, well, I worked a long time ago, like with Ray and Dave, where, I mean, you, there was a whole lot of sports news going on. on so you, you knew who the people were. But if people don't know who the athletes are, who the swimmers are, who the cricketers are, who whatever, you know what I'm saying? Then it's difficult for them to express the support. I mean, I think you have to build that excitement in people as well. Yeah. And, Margaret, and if it's not there. Let me jump in on this one with Margaret, because over the years, you know that the media landscape has changed. Back in, back in the time when you had that kind of coverage on sport, you know, you had national stations so true emphasis was not on earning money it was just on coverage and providing information for people fast forward to the times that we live in now i know that when i used to be at cc6 we used to have a program called sporting highlights yes. mm -hmm. we used to go to schools sherry and noel in particular used to go to all the school sports and cover them and we used to package it and we used to broadcast it weekdays, Thursday evenings, Sundays on the channel, sporting highlights. Get sponsorship for it, no? Get anybody to sponsor it, no? You ain't getting a dime. Mm, wow. You, you have to breathe a special thanks to some sponsor who you manage to squeeze a couple dollars out of to sponsor the program. Get sponsorship for it. No, it ain't happening. Yeah, and, and I, 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 yeah, and I was making, yeah, and that is one of the, you know, Beth's, you know, point there is on point because the, we talk a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we are good talkers. <laughs> but when it what comes to the action and the action is holistic as you say right. getting the sponsors to to, to to back the initiative and things like that so sometimes but even go ahead even mm -hmm. when now this dispensation is so much easier with the likes of social media and with whatsapp mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. all the videos for when I started doing this thing it was just the phone right exactly <laughs> so I have to depend on Calling Francie, calling his and Regis and the others on a on a Sunday when I know that they already compete, com, you know, competed, and getting their times and you know because internet in this time wasn't big, you know, exactly. And like that. So and but now it, it's so much easier in that you can basically just click and get information instantly in fact you, you can be on the road you know and information is on your, your, your you know your fingertips so i'm saying that to say that while the sponsors the critical part of it i think sometimes as the media sometimes in some instances um and, and i'm not taking away from what has been done and i know but we have spoken a lot about you know what you have been doing and thing when you were there but um, I, I think there's a lot that can be done, especially as it relates to what's happening locally with our um, sportsmen and women. And, and again, I'm hearing a lot of big talk about the intercall and all these sort of things. And I, I think in the whole scheme of things, other sporting disciplines, other persons involved in sports are getting left. We, we we talking about netballers. We talking about basketballers. In the whole, I know we have some more talking to do, but in the big conversation with the intercall for now, we you know what happens to all the other sporting disciplines that have been affected and cancelled. 
you know, <laughs> when you look at it, right? Start football, um, D sport shot, netball, mm -hmm. volleyball, you had swimming, we had basketball, cricket, independence cricket, for example. Mm -hmm. It should be all normal cricket mm -hmm. should be played because leading up to independence, all that's affected. We're only hearing and, about in the call because and, like I said, and, and that's exactly that is exactly why I wanted us to have this conversation this evening. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden it's all about intercall and i'm like if we care about the children so much why is it only the children who are supposed to participate in intercall that we care about why don't we care about the children who should have been in all of those other meets that that michael just mentioned which have been cancelled the football the netball the volleyball the cricket those are children who are involved in those too so i believe if you're going to take a principled stand to stage some kind of event to compensate for intercall. You should do it for all the others too. What yeah, is the justification for doing it for intercall and not the others? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the argument would have hold better if you had done that rather than just the intercall again. I guess intercall is a showpiece. Um, I, 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 I don't understand what is different about in track and field intercall than probably football, intercall football, you know, <laughs> to me, they, exactly. all, they involve, they involve um, school, they involve schools and competing, competing in sports and, you know, and the whole rivalry and thing. And, and that's what I'm saying. The, it's a sort of imbalance. And, uh, and I think sometimes that is why we find some of our young sportsmen and women. And uh, yes, I congratulate the few who take the initiative, being determined, probably being spurred on by their parents and their coaches, and uh, they, there's a support system that assists them probably at the schools because in some cases, the teachers are the coaches, you know? Um, but there are so many others who just got frustrated. You mm -hmm. know, we talk about Darren Moodoo, and I hear Darren Moodoo's name has been called now and all these sort of things, but it's the same Darren Moodoo, for example, who has been there and who has been running for SAS and ACE and, you know, yearning for the, the attention, yearning for the opportunity, and nobody has studied him, you know? And, and you it's know? a group of guys I'm referring to who are now at colleges and doing well, and hopefully this weekend we will see them on in Boston representing their school, but Grenada as well, you know? Mm -hmm. um, be doing well, you know? Right, but and you, you, you said something kind of in passing, you know, Michael, but I'm not going to let it slide so easy. When you talk about using social media to hype up some of these things and get it out there, you have sports in your blood. You do it. Other people who don't have sports in their blood will not do it. You know, you have some guys, I made a joke, I made a joke really. Not a joke, but it's a serious thing. On one of these cricket fanatics posts, I said, boy, I thank you for keeping me up to date with the cricket because I don't have the patience to sit down and watch this thing play cricket no more. So <laughs> when I want to know what's happening, I take a peek on his page and I say, oh, same thing again, and I'm gone. <laughs> so you have a few guys like you out there who will do it. But that's not reporting on sport and hyping up and zoning in on an event and doing what is necessary to promote an event until it happens. That still takes money. And if it's going to be done in social media, trust me, Michael, these media houses need to learn how to use social media because they don't. And I say that without apology and anybody who wants to beat me can come look at me and beat me. They do not know how to use social media. So whatever they're doing, it, it's not effective. Well, That's yeah. just one part. I think and they do not know how to use it effectively. <laughs> right. So yeah. They don't know how to use it effectively. Right. And the other point is the composition of our newsrooms do not leave resources to deal with social media. Well. You know, and Beverly, I'm glad you, you came back to the newsrooms because what I was going to say is that I think almost every media host in Grenada, from what I see, has a newscast. Mm -hmm. And I want to think that the largest audience 
would be at that point in time because you know people tune into the news whether they like it or not the mm -hmm. question would be what section of that cast and how much of that cast is dedicated to sports reporting of itself what, what type of sports right Sports because because I, that is one way also where you will get the word out because you know the chances are like you said you know you you guys did this this sports highlight program really and truly to take diehard sport fans to really tune into a program of that nature whereas mm -hmm. the average person will tune in for your newscast mm -hmm. and most right. likely will hang around for the sports cast as well mm -hmm. so yes. and, and the quality of what you get in sports because Michael talk about some of these news that happened and I follow the sports news locally and I don't even hear them mention. There's no coverage. And then the, the thing is too, um, I remember like when Michael was there and working, Michael was a, was a dedicated sports person. I mean, I worked in the days when Ray was working. Ray was a dedicated sports person as well. Then I also remember Zareth McMillan as well as being, you know, these were dedicated sports people definitely into sports. So that's the other thing. It's not simply having somebody there, but somebody who's genuinely into the stuff, who knows it and knows how to report it well to generate that kind of excitement as well. And you know yeah. something? Anything that people do well, number one, if you have a passion for it, you will do it well. Mm -hmm. But number two, you have to learn how to do it. You can't just take somebody off the street fresh graduate out of high school, throw them into the sporting arena and tell them, you work on a sport. And they go to their first game, they're totally lost, they don't know what is happening, they don't understand it, they can't do a proper story on it. So the person lose interest even before they have interest because they have no guidance. Mm -hmm. So it's a broad spectrum when it comes to proper coverage and reporting on sport. The, the reporter journalists may not, may not particularly like sports, but because of how they learn it, they get into it and they're able to do a proper job. Many of them become sports enthusiasts after, not before, because but you have I'm, to learn the industry before you can like it. And, you know, Bev, that, that's a really good point because, I mean, a lot of time. I mean, when I was working in the station, I was working with Ray and me, right? On Sundays and weekends when Ray is going out in the country to cover things. I mean, it's a whole side of us who just go with him. I mean, because if, if I wasn't working, you know, I didn't have to work. Yeah, Ray would say, yeah, let's go. We're going. I don't know the teams. I don't know whatever. But after a while of going around, yeah, you got into it. I mean, literally, you, you just, you, the interest just that built. Is how, that is how I got to love cricket. Uh, no, I, I still didn't like cricket to keep that. No, that is why I got to know <laughs> cricket. Me that one. When I was a teenager, I had a sister-in-law, one of my older brother's wife. I was spending some time with them, and that woman loved cricket more than how she loved cook food. So in the house all the time, cricket talk, cricket on radio, cricket, cricket. I got sucked into this thing. And when I got sucked into it, I couldn't get out. I was hooked. No, if I didn't have that kind of exposure to it, I would not have had any interest in cricket or probably any other sport. But, well, I, I always loved netball because I used to play netball. But that is how you get drawn into it, by being around people who are excited about it and people who can share it with you from that kind of perspective, you know. you. I mean, you just get sucked into it. But when you take someone who does not have any affinity with sport and tell them, you all have a sport. Go on down there, sir. School will have sports, got it. They're lost. And that shows in what comes over your TV screen or comes out on your internet news. It shows. Mm -hmm. People who have no interest in it. The one who write it, they have no interest. So the it's not going to interest anybody to watch it. Yeah. And, and Michael, question for you too. I mean, I know that um, you, when you were pretty active with um, the media associations up and down the region and training and stuff, did anything come up for like sports journalism? Yeah. And training well, for areas yeah. in that? Well, they had, uh, um, yes, there were one or two, but uh, the thing about it, and by the way, the, the problems we identify is not something that is 
Grenada is only in Grenada. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Regional. So, uh, so that's why we're talking regional. Regional. Yeah, but there were one of two um, um, sporting, you know, opportunities that came up. I know football, for example, through CONCACAF would have had these things. Um, I can't recall West Indies cricket um, doing something like that in recent times, but I know of football and I know of the IWF through no. the NACA have been having. Okay, no, happy because the, specifically yeah, um, for journalists, specifically yeah, for journalists. Be because there are actually sports journalism programs at some J schools. My J school definitely had yeah, a sports yeah, journalism yeah. program. Um, so I, you know, so you you actually specialize in sports right. journalism. And I, I think I think Barbados Community College is one of those that I can think of that has a sports journalism program, for example. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. Barbados Community College has one. But, but um, you know, in all that we have been saying, I want to bring something to the attention of the folks here. And that has to do with something you have been hearing about for a while. And I've been clamoring over and over, especially to the national associations who represent the sportsmen and women. There's something called the national sports policy. The national sports policy is legislated, so it's law. It was passed in, I think it was November 2010 or sometime in 2011, but it had bipartisan support. I, I know this is an American term, bipartisan, but <laughs> at the time, um, the opposition supported it, right? Uh, in fact, the current prime minister was opposition leader, and I recall him in parliament basically stating that he gives this full support. In fact, he, he even spoke about it, the national sports policy himself. And there were four members of the opposition at the time in parliament, and they basically supported it. So it passed bipartisan support. And I'm still asking the question to this day, eight years later, eight or nine years later, why haven't we implemented the national sports policy? It's there. It's the law. Maybe <laughs> you know? the fiscal space don't allow. No, and, and <laughs> that, 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 that to me, in fact, I recall the leader of the opposition saying he supports it. His only concern at the time had to do with the funding. So the answer was, we do not have to implement implement wholesale, we can phase this. You know, there are aspects of the national sports policy that can be implemented, which, and you know, part, to be honest with you, what is happening today regarding the governance of sports and all that's happening regarding even the quote unquote intercall could have been addressed in the issue of the national sports policy. If you read the document, you will see a whole new structure in terms of the national sports policy, the implementation, or the establishment of a national sports council, parish sports councils. So in truth and in fact, if we had a situation like that, there wasn't the need for government or ministry, you know, because we could have worked with the parish sports council or the national sports council. And by now, the whole issue of the, you know, the, 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 the how sports is governed and administrating Grenada would have changed. Let me just, I, 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 I always keep it with me because it's my part of my sports Bible regarding Grenada, you know? And there's a section in it in the preamble that basically addresses an issue. It says, while sporting activities and competitions are an integral part of the activities of the education system, there is not a consistent philosophy and approach guiding sports activities at the school level. This is in our sports policy. It addresses the issue and it addresses the current issue as well, because it says that there is not a consistent philosophy and approach guiding sporting activities at the school level. And it, it goes as far as saying it has therefore developed, it has therefore meaning the government, this national sports policy to provide a framework for the development of sport in Grenada and also to guide the relationship between the ministry and you know the various stakeholders and things like that so and you know the, the whole rationale of the sports policy therefore is based on the conviction that grenada can capitalize on the increase on and increase the benefits to be derived from sports by implementing relevant structures and mechanisms 
to build and enhance the manner in which sports and sporting activities are organized and implemented. It, it, it's, it's, it's broad in itself, uh, uh, you know, and so many things in it that we can look at and ask ourselves, why haven't we taken that approach to implement aspects of the sports policy? And by now, would address so many issues, including that of incentives for our sportsmen and women. When they represent Grenada, in the sports policy, it does not say in dollars and cents, but it speaks of incentives for even the coaches. It speaks of incentives for businesses who give the time off for national representation. So if I have a business and I have so a footballer, for example, he can get the time off. And as a business place, there is incentives in that, including um, tax write-offs, et cetera, et cetera. In, you know, incentives for the businesses as well to encourage the national representation. It addresses the sports policy, addresses that. And I'm asking the question, and I continue to ask the question, why our national federations, sporting federations, are not pressuring the authorities to implement some aspects of the national sports policy because it's in the interest of the associations and their charges. You know, um, it's not in the interest now for the government. And I, I mean, if I'm the government and you're not coming to me, I could always say, well, the yeah, federations, are, they have no interest in it. So what's the big deal? Right, well, that's, yeah. The yeah. associations have to take up the mantle and say, hey, we have participated in the national consultations. By the way, I even traveled to Grenada during the consultations to participate in them. We have participated in it, and we think it can benefit, even if it means in some cases we may have to, after eight years, we may have to look at certain aspects of it and improve it. But it's, it's the law. It has been legislated. It's yeah, just been but laws can be amended as the need be. Yeah, you know, structures what, are there, but we're just not <laughs> adhering to them. But what you are saying in my mind says one thing. We're not in the least bit interested in national development and development of the country. This thing called Project Grenada is a joke, an absolute joke. I don't know who coined the phrase or why they coined the phrase, but it has absolutely nothing to do with national development. Because for something to grow, it has to go from the root. It cannot, you can't have branch and leaf if you don't have root. And if things like the national sports policy, we're speaking specifically to sports now. If you do not go to the root and have a proper foundation, forget about everything else. Forget about coming to campus, set both four oh, teachers decided not doing it, we go do it. That not helping nothing. That is not even a plaster on a sore foot. That is just a sore foot running. You see? So I, you know, and and, and you, you know what is so interesting about that? The president of the Olympic Committee of Trinidad and Tobago in his end of year address, uh he urged sportsmen and women in Trinidad to put pressure on their federations to come up, to start working on a national sports policy. <laughs> Grenada has one, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but here is Trinidad and Tobago with all the resources in terms of facilities and, you know, Mm -hmm. world-class velodrome and stadia and swimming facilities, all of that. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Michael. They're talking about the sports policy. Is there any copyright attached to it to cancel to Trinidad? <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. Right? Mr. 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 Leon Charles was the mm -hmm. facilitator in getting the sports policy. He was contracted at the time to put mm -hmm. the sports policy. And it involved a lot of consultation and things. But I'm saying it was easier in, a, in the context of Grenada because you know you you have probably about you know 12 or so national federations and it was easy to just have a couple of consultations going around when it comes to places like trinidad and these other places and you have all these quote unquote major sportsmen and women mm -hmm. with all these various views 
this is things that will probably take a couple of years. But the fact is they're talking about it, which, mm -hmm. is, which is important. And I think we have to start looking at that because it addresses a lot of the issues. Because all for now, and going back to the current issue and the current impasse, I'm not too you know, involved or you know, have much information regarding why, how they reach where they are. I'm just concerned about what has taken place because I know a lot of the teachers, and I, I made that point, as you would have seen, since December 1st. In fact, I wrote two Yeah, posts. I remember that. December mm -hmm. 1st and December 4th. Mm -hmm. And I said, if this current impasse is not resolved, mm -hmm. we stand the chance of this, that, and the other. We have to start working on that. And I was sort of surprised that with the, 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 the talks that took place, that the discussions that took place over the period of time that that probably didn't even come on the table because if we were so concerned that I should have been something that could have been rest on the table yeah of course we're running out of time so i want to give all the suspects a few seconds to have a last word catherine you have a last word you want to put in no. <laughs> margaret no, I, I, you know, oh, yeah. I think Michael, Michael has pretty much said it, <laughs> yeah. it all. I mean, you can't add anything to that. To no, that. No. I mean, there's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to add to what he said. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to encourage the, the support for our um, sportsmen and women. And again, I'm saying not just those in North America and outside of Grenada, especially those in Grenada who are making a name for themselves and who are yearning for that support that attention and again as god says the support doesn't have to always be dollars and cents the mm -hmm. support comes in many ways how mm -hmm. are you doing how are you training how you know going out and see them perform whether it's swimming whether it's football cricket you know basketball not just the rush on the so and so on one, one, it, one particular one event. particular thing intercall not just that and we get hype up and emotional about this but then after intercall, we don't hear you until probably next intercall. Exactly. Yeah. You know, Grenada is celebrating how many years as an independent nation? In 45. Years. You know? 45. 45 years. 45 years. I mean, 45 years as a nation is young. But as an individual, when you're 45 years old and get up and acting like your five-year-old it's not pretty because it shows that you have some kind of mental deficiency and those who are in positions of leadership in our country who are acting like they have some kind of mental deficiency they need to at least have enough in them to say look i can't do this job let me give it to somebody else to do it and before anybody misquote me, I am not talking party here. I am talking, if you know you can't do the job, look for somebody who you believe can do it and give it to them. Because we have far too many square pegs in round holes, spinning top in mud, and the same children that we love so much, not benefiting one bit out of all the pompous things are going on. Mark my words about that. So this is Mekki Chat. I thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your insight and your knowledge about yeah. sports. And we look forward to meeting everyone here again next week. Hopefully, Jerry will be back with us. We've surely missed him this evening. But good night, all. Have a great weekend.